Hello and welcome back to Seconds Out. My name is Eamon Khan and this is nothing short of a pleasure to be speaking to the incomparable Hall of Fame boxing journalist Thomas Hauser on the subject of boxing. Thomas, thank you for your time. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Nice to be with you. Nice to be with you too. I want to start off firstly to explore further your thoughts on Auntie Joshua's career and the article which stirs a stir regarding where you felt Auntie Joshua's options lay in terms of his fight future, that being retirement as a prime option due to your concern for his well-being. Did his recent fight with Robert Hellenius do anything to change or solidify your position on where AJ's future should lie? No, there was no change. First, I'm a big Anthony Joshua fan. I don't know him well personally. I know him largely from a distance, but everything I have seen you know, from and about Jonathan Anthony leads me to believe that he's a good person. Uh, I think he was a good fighter, but uh, he's just, he's done the best of what he's going to accomplish in boxing. He won an Olympic gold medal. Uh, the night he knocked out Vladimir Klitschko in front of 90,000 screaming fans in Wembley Stadium was just an enthralling night for boxing. But whatever it was he once had, he doesn't have it anymore, and he's not going to get it back. Uh, he's no longer willing to walk through the fire to win. He's become a tentative fighter. He's at an age now where fighters do start to shut to, to slow down. Uh, from what I understand, he's got you know a, a, an extraordinary amount of money, uh, yeah, more than enough to see him through several lifetimes. He has generational wealth. And getting hit in the head isn't good for you. If it was, every time you and I went to the doctor, they'd whack us in the head with a mallet. Uh, and look, I spent a lot of time with Muhammad Ali, who was a cautionary tale for what happens to fighters if they fight too long. I have no knowledge of any kind that Anthony is suffering from any kind of brain trauma at the moment. But the possibility is always there. I think he has gotten the best of what he has gotten out of boxing. He'll always have the glory of, of his Olympic gold medal and his heavyweight championship wins. And as a big fan of his, I would like to see him get out of boxing. At the other end of the spectrum, I feel the same way about Nico uh, Ali Walsh, Muhammad's grandson, who just lost his first fight. Now, Nico hasn't accomplished the same things that Anthony did in boxing. He has a much lower ceiling. Fighting is a dangerous sport. And my belief is, is that you know, as somebody who, who knows Anthony Joshua from a distance, who likes everything I've seen about him, I'd like to see him retire. Now, yeah, Eddie Hearn went ballistic when I said that. Uh, Eddie Hearn spent, uh, I don't know if we can use you know swear words, so I'll just say Eddie spent a whole day in Mexico when he, you know, I, I thought he would have been focused on promoting uh, Canelo Alvarez against John Ryder, and he spent you know, a good part of the day MFing me for the article I wrote in The Observer saying the bravest thing Anthony could do now is retire from boxing. You know, Eddie stands to make a lot of money from Anthony continuing to fight. He has a vested interest in this. So, you know, again, I wrote it. I don't regret writing it. The Anthony's a grown-up. He'll make his own decision. Uh, when he fights, uh, my heart is in his gloves, but I'd like to see him retire for his sake. Not going to change my life. I was going to ask you, reading your article, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it seems it's not only to do with potential future damage, but also the measure of success he has had and any future fights could breach the wrong side of risk-reward, more so than just to do with the issue of well-being. So do you, do you feel if fights against Fury and Wilder weren't in the offering, that Anti Joshua could continue without having you know, his well-being being on the line as much than fight with Fury Wilder would do so. Well, look, Anthony can continue fighting guys like Jermaine Franklin and Robert Hellenius, which is what he did this year. And obviously they pose less of a threat. But I assume that Jermaine and Robert both hit hard enough that if they hit you in the head, they could do some damage. 
You spar in the gym when you're getting ready for fights. The head doesn't know if it was hit you know, during a, a sparring session or a real fight. I mean, getting hit in the head isn't good for you. You know, most of us can count on one hand the number of times when we banged our head and it hurt. That happens to fighters all the time. So there's a constant risk-reward factor. Anthony isn't going to do anything to enhance his legacy by fighting Jermaine Franklin and Robert Hellenius. If he came back and beat Deontay Wilder, would it help his legacy? Probably. I don't think he's going to beat Deontay Wilder. I just think he's going to take a lot of punches. He'll take a lot of punches in the gym getting ready for that fight, which, by the way, I don't think is going to happen in January. That's another whole issue. But I just, again, you know, could he prove me wrong, you know, in the sense that he has more great glories in boxing? Yeah, I don't think he's going to. And at the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You know, how does Anthony talk? You know, if, if you can just give me a moment here, I'm going to pull something up on my computer because it's something that Anthony said. So we'll take this right out of AJ's mouth. Just give me a moment to, uh, to pull this up. Uh, Absolutely. Take your time. Hold on one sec. This is a quote from Anthony. It sure. was an interview that uh, he did. Uh, yeah, actually, it was published in another publication the same day my article ran. Anthony was speaking at an Under Armour Next Academy event. And this is what Anthony said. This is word for word what Anthony said. In boxing, people walk in the gym one way and not many walk out the same way because of the trauma and the stuff they put their body through. I want my legacy to be I walked out healthy. Imagine me at age 50 or 60 in a wheelchair, fragile because of the trauma I put my body through. My legacy should be when I'm old, I'm still fresh. I want people to say, oh wow, he still looks good, he still looks after himself. That's a legacy, end quote. Okay, you know, I couldn't have said it better than Anthony did. So, you know, that, 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 that's it. That's how I felt. You know, people of goodwill can disagree with me. Thomas, how, how much of your opinion is formed from what we saw in the night where Andy Ruiz shocked the world and defeated Andy Joshua in, in stunning fashion? That's a piece of the puzzle. But, you know, look, even before that, if you look at Anthony's fights subsequent to Klitschko, uh, he was never that impressive again. He got more and more tentative as fights went on. The first fight against Ruiz was painful to watch. The second fight, I thought it was awful. I mean, people said, oh, look, he's, he's dancing. Look at his jab. No, no. He was running for most of that fight. A good, he, he threw a stay away from me jab. You know, it's let pick up a few points from me, jab, in that second Ruiz fight. A good jab hurts. It cuts, as we just saw from uh, Alexander Usyk and Daniel Dubois. A good jab can knock you down. That's not the kind of jab AJ was throwing against Ruiz in the second fight. Again, AJ is still a quality fighter. He's one of the better heavyweights in the world today. To me, the risk-reward uh, ratio you know, weighs in favor of his retiring now. Again, there are people of goodwill who disagree with, with me. The final decision is Anthony's. There was a, you've mentioned this. Um, there's a clear disparity between your stance and his promoter, Eddie Hearn's stance, who felt that none of your article when I spoke to him resonated with him at all. Was that a response that you expected from, from Eddie? Of course. And what's that he going to say? I've got, uh, you know, two meal tickets. One of them is uh, in a PE bind, PED bind at the moment. And uh, Thomas Hauser says the other should retire. But without DAZN funding his operation, Eddie Hearn would be doing very poorly in boxing right now. That's my opinion. You know, they, they are funding, you know, at, at, at great expense and at great loss to the zone, a series of what I think are disappointing fights, not delivering a quality product. I'm talking about the zone now. Uh, 
Look, Eddie's a businessman. It's his job to make money. But uh, I don't like some of the things that he's done in doing it. There's another piece of your puzzle in terms of you formulating your opinion on Ice Joshua, the, this consensus feeling from a lot of people in the industry that Joshua is now, as a result of this Ruiz fight, gun shy. Can Derek James form him into a fighter who is no longer gun shy and has more defensive merit to his game? Now, look, I have never heard, I've been in boxing a while now, I have never heard a trainer say, my fighter is gun shy and his defense you know, is lacking. That's not what they say. You know, I've never heard a promoter say, I expect my guy to lose. There are certain things you expect people to say. Uh, you know, when Errol Spence fought Terence Crawford, uh, that told us something about how things were going in Derek James's gym. And again, Derek James is a good trainer, but uh, you know, there's just a limited amount you can do with Anthony Joshua at this point in time. And yes, if Anthony was to fight Deontay Wilder, or Tyson Fury, you know, Eddie Hearn would make a huge payday. Derek James, assuming he's still the trainer, because they, they just change trainers from time to time, you know, the trainer would make a nice payday, you know. And, and, and Derek's also entitled to his opinion. Maybe he really feels that, you know. Derek's in the gym with AJ every day. I'm not. From what I've seen, you know, and the proof of the pudding is in the fights, uh, AJ is not the fighter he once was. And the risks now outweigh the rewards of continuing to fight. And of course, one of the most pernicious things of brain damage in boxing is you don't see it until it's too late. By the time you see it, it's irreversible and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse after you've retired from boxing. I was moving on. I want to talk to you about uh, last weekend's Usyk Dubois Unified Heavyweight Title Defense. Uh, I want to pick up on your your notes on on the fight from your boxing news article. At round four, you mentioned Usyk looks beatable, but Dubois doesn't look like the man for the job. Is there a man for the job? Is that man for the job? Fury, given Usyk's immense skill. Yeah, I I I, I still have doubts about Alexander Usyk as a heavyweight. He was a Marvelous, marvelous cruiserweight. If you look at, at what Alexander has done at heavyweight, he struggled against Chaz Witherspoon and Derek Chisora, who were very two very ordinary fighters. He had the two wins over Anthony Joshua, but Anthony's head, as we've just talked about, has been in a strange place lately. And to me, Daniel Dubois is a very ordinary fighter. So I don't know how much about uh, Alexander that fight told us. I don't think he has what we think of today is a heavyweight punch. I'm not sure he takes a heavyweight punch. You know, is he a very skilled boxer? Yes. He has incredible heart. One of the things that impresses me is, is in all the fights I've seen him, particularly, you know, the second Joshua fight, you know, when he is hit and hurt, he fires back. I mean, he is in there fighting in addition to boxing. But I question how he would fare against a legitimate heavyweight. I think he would outbox Deontay Wilder for however long it took for Deontay to hit him and knock him out. Uh, and I think Tyson Fury is just too big for him and would outbox him and knock him out. We'll move over to Fury Usyk in a second. You also made note of, and a lot of people have made note of, Dubois' mentality, questioning it, and you believe he falls short of the standard to walk through fire in an effort to win this fight. Now, people will point towards the Joyce fight where he decided to take a knee after suffering an injury in the second fight, but then also you could say to the other stance that um, his effort against Lorena when he was seriously hurt might dispel thoughts about his heart. Did that do anything to dispel his thoughts? It seems unlikely that it has. No, well, first, in terms of the Joe Joyce fights, uh, I don't think you can fairly criticize a fighter for choosing to uh, discontinue the fight when he has a broken orbital bone or other damage around the eye socket. I mean, that threatens permanent damage to the eye, and I have no problem with a fighter stopping at that point. And to my way of thinking, the referee, his corner, 
and the ring doctor should stop it uh, at that point also. So let's put that one aside. Against Lorena, he was fighting a very, very ordinary fighter. I understand that, uh, at least I'm led to understand, that he had some knee damage that, that he suffered when he was hit the first time. But uh, it's one thing to show hard against a, somebody who's essentially a low-level club fighter, and it's another thing to show hard against a world-class opponent. Uh, yeah, two different things altogether. Uh, now, I limited my comments to the fight against Usyk when I said he didn't fight. You know, and, and what I said, and, and I don't have the exact words in front of me, but when, when people fight professionally, they are held to a different standard than you and me. I mean, that's a given, you know. You know, you hit me in the face, and if I'm cut above the eye and I'm bleeding, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and run to the emergency room. <laughs> you know, if I'm a professional fighter, I keep fighting. You know, it's 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 it's, it's a totally different. It, 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 fighters are different from you and me. At least they're different from me. You know, I I don't have in me what. A, it would take to be a professional fighter. I sit on the easy side of the ropes. I understand that. But I can appreciate what it does take to be a professional fighter. And I mean, when, when Daniel said after the fight, well, you know, when I knocked him down and knocked him out and the referee called him a low blow, I got disheartened. That to me is garbage. I mean, it seems to me if you really think you knocked him down with a legitimate punch, what you say to yourself is, hey, I just hurt this guy. You know, in my mind, the referee let him off the hook, but I'm going to go out there and hurt him again. And instead what happened was Usyk got up from the knockdown, and if I remember correctly, won the rest of that round. I mean, he came back at Daniel, and Daniel wilted. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 I wrote it, uh, I said it. I don't think Daniel acquitted himself like a championship heavyweight boxer in that fight. Uh, now, again, takes a rare person who can, but I don't think he did. Oh, Alexander Wittick, on the other hand, makes the most of what he has in terms of his heart. Are we to make much of the potential avenue of appeal from Frank Warren and Daniel Dubois' team? Uh, Frank Warren is Daniel's promoter. Uh, he has an obligation to do right by Daniel, and he also wants to do right by himself. And we're dealing with the World Boxing Association. So, you know, they'll do what they think is in their best interest. So I have no idea what will happen. From my point of view, it's a bogus controversy. I was watching the fight on television. The second the punch landed, before the referee made his call, I said, that's a low blow. I went back. I have watched the knockdown multiple times in freeze frame with stop action. I think it was a low blow. Was part of the fist on the belt line? Yeah. Most of the fist was below. The punch was coming up. My sense is that it jammed uh, Usyk's protective cut into his testicles. The way he went down was not the way a fighter goes down who's hit by a paralyzing body shot. You see these body shots and it's almost like the fighter just stands for a second before he crumples. You know, Usyk went down, whap, you know, there, there, there went, and, and he was in immediate agony. And uh, so, you know, I think it was a low blow. Again, I understand there are people who disagree with me, uh, most of the people who are most vociferously saying it was a legitimate blow are Dubois partisans. Uh, many of the people who are vociferously saying it was a low blow are Usyk partisans. I have no axe to grind in this one. I had no dog in that fight. I was watching it as an impartial observer. I thought it was a low blow. That's my opinion. Low blow controversies aside, Alexander Usyk goes through with the victory. It seems like a fight defending his IBF and, of course, unified heavyweight titles comes against the mandatory, next mandatory, Philip Hergovic. Tyson Fury is taking on Francis Ngannou in a fight slash exhibition. Do you sit confident right now that we will get to see an undisputed showdown between Fury and Usyk this year, next year, or at all? 
Uh, who knows? Look, yeah, the, the, the heavy. This this is one of the things that's killing boxing. Yeah, I mean, most sports give fans the events they want when they want to see them, and you know, we just went through the World Cup, the Women's World Cup. You know, they played the tournament. At the end, the teams that got all the way through it played each other, and you had a World Cup champion. You know, when, when, when you have Wimbledon, at the end of the day, you know, Djokovic plays Alcaraz, you know, because they earned their way there. You have an enthralling event, and you have a men's Wimbledon champion. Boxing doesn't do that. If, if you go back to the end of 2022, last year, and people were saying, oh, 2023 is going to be a golden era for heavyweight boxing. You've got Fury, Usyk, Wilder, Joshua. They're all going to be fighting each other. Well, it was fool's gold. Iron pie, was it iron pyrite? Is that what it That's was? That's right. Yeah. Gold. It, it was, if you look at what they've done this year, Fury is going to have one fight against Francis Ngannou, who, who's a novice, who's never had been in a professional boxing match before. It now looks as though Wilder's not going to fight at all this year. Usyk had one fight against Dubois. Joshua fought Jermaine Franklin and Robert Hellenius. This is what we were left with after being told at the end of last year, oh, 2023 is going to be a golden year for heavyweight boxing. You know, who's at fault? You know, the fighters are at fault. The promoters are at fault. You know, the sanctioning bodies, you know, the networks. You know, and the fans get shafted. It's been a less than golden By year. By the way, one more thought. Can you imagine? I mean, the last time boxing had a unified heavyweight champion was 20, I think, what, 2003, Lennox Lewis. Can you imagine if it took, you know, the National Football League more than 20 years to crown a new Super Bowl champion? Or, or the World Cup to have a new World Cup champion or Wimbledon. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's nuts. You know, that, that's one of the main reasons why boxing is now a niche sport. Another reason uh, for that and another reason why it's been a less than golden year right now in boxing is because of the reoccurrence of PEDs in the sport. Are there any set answers you feel to tackle what is a problem that seems to be a growing problem in the sport right now? Yeah. There's one credible PED testing organization in the world today, and that's VADA. VADA tests the fighters thoroughly. It reports the results to all of the relevant parties, including the Governing Athletic Commission. And if you are seriously interested in dealing with the PED scourge in boxing, you do testing with VADA, not USADA, which, you know, and I wrote about this in the past, there was a, USADA, when they were testing professional boxers, tested 1,501 fighters for PEDs, and they reported one positive result, one out of more than 1,500 to a governing state athletic commission, and that was after somebody leaked the results on a, on a website. Uh, that they, they were, you know, adjudicating themselves, as, as they said, which, you know, one might call covering up. Drug-free sport isn't the answer. You can make a deal with drug-free sport where, you know, drug-free sport reports the results to whoever pays for it. And then it's uh, up to that person, whether it's the promoter of the fight or somebody else, to decide it. Just picking that back up, where we had some technical gremlins stopping the flow of the conversation, but you were saying regarding drug free sport not being the answer and VADA being the answer? Yeah, they're, 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 in the first place, drug free sport doesn't test for nearly as many things as VADA tests. Uh, there was some uh, attention paid least recently to a positive test that uh, Alicia Baumgartner had with drug free sport. My understanding, and, and you can check with drug free sport on this, but I, I'm pretty certain this is right, is that they didn't, they, 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 she tested positive for a banned performance enhancing drug, but drug-free sport didn't even test for EPO or human growth hormone. 
on that panel. Well, that's a pretty serious omission. And then, of course, they reported it to Eddie Hearn because Eddie paid for the tests. Now, in this instance, Eddie chose to report the positive results to the appropriate parties. Uh, I don't know that Eddie would have made the same decision if it had been Connor Ben testing positive right before the Chris Eubanks fight. It's quite possible, possible that under those circumstances, Eddie would have gone to Connor and said, you know, what is this? And Connor would have said, Eddie, I swear to you, I'm a clean fighter. And Eddie could have said, well, I know Connor well. I look deep into his eyes and I believe him. You know, that's hypothetical, but it wouldn't have shock me if something like that would have unfolded at some point in the future. Any reporting of a, let, let's start with drug, with, with drug testing and boxing for performance enhancing drugs. First, you have to do the appropriate testing. And that means testing for the you know, drugs, you know, the way VADA does, not just the drugs VADA tests for, but also using carbon isotope ratio testing and, and, and does it cost more money to do it right? Yeah, everything does. So first you have to test properly. Then you have to report the results to the proper parties. And at the very least, that should be both fighters, their camps, and uh, the governing state athletic commission. Does this come down to overall an issue with costs when it comes to drugs and drug testing? Cost, cost is part of the issue, but it also is an issue of integrity and will and understanding that we're not talking about running faster or hitting a baseball further. We're talking about punching people in the head harder. And, uh, you know, you spend the money. Now, I think you have to apportion the money. Can you do full testing, you know, 365 days a year for every fighter in a promoter's stable? No, absolutely not. What you can do is have random testing for all fighters, which actually the WBC has now through its clean boxing program if you're ranked in the top 15 in any weight division, you're subject to spot testing. And then obviously you would test more frequently, you know, for elite fighters, for world champions, for fighters who have major bouts coming up. That's how you bring it within the realm of being cost efficient. Look, I would like to see networks because, you know, if you look at really where the power resides in boxing, promoters are only good, as good as their TV contracts. You know, I would like to see DAZN, ESPN, Showtime, you know, uh, TNT, is that what BT is now in the UK? Yeah. You know, all the big networks, say Sky Sport, you know, say we will not televise fights mm -hmm. unless the fighters subject themselves to random BADA drug testing. Now, the truth is networks won't do that because they're afraid that certain fighters who might not be clean then will gravitate to other networks. Promoters will be reluctant to do it because they might lose some of their fighters. But the, the fighters, at the end of the day, the fighters have to take the lead on this because they're the ones who are getting hit in the head. And too few of them do. What would you say is a suitable reflection of punishment when it comes to fighters who are proven to have taken performance enhancing substances? It seems that, look, it does vary from case to case because each case is individual, but it doesn't seem that we are getting the bans that a an integral sport to keep its integrity should be dealing out in these circumstances. Okay. It, first, it, 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 vary, it, it varies, as you suggested, based on the circumstances. First, if a fighter says, <clears throat> yes, this was in my system. I take full responsibility for it. I'm not going to fight it. That, to me, weighs in favor of leniency. That's what happened with Canelo Alvarez when there was clenbuterol in his system. 
And it legitimately could have come from tainted beef under the circumstances. Canelo was as tested as any fighter ever in the history of boxing. Canelo took responsibility for it. He said it was in my system. He got a six-month punishment. I, I, to me, that sounded reasonable. I would say a minimum of two years and maybe more. And of course, it also depends on the severity of the drug. Mm -hmm. Thomas, um, very convincing that I've taken up a lot more of your time and there's a lot on the table that I could be asking you. However, um, I'd like to leave that for another day, another time to speak to you. So thank you for speaking to me and seconds out. I'll just leave one final question to yourself. Um, do you have a recommendation of any books to read in terms of boxing for someone who'd like to, yes, like to know more about the sport? Well, of, of, of course, I'm partial to my own. And uh, I just, e each year, the University of Arkansas Press brings out a collection of all the articles I wrote the year before. And the new book, which just came back from the printer, is called The Universal Sport. That actually has all the articles I wrote about, about boxing in uh, 2021 and 2022. So I would say The Universal Sport is the most current. There's obviously, you know, the big Ali biography, Muhammad Ali is Life and Times, which goes back a ways. Uh, but uh, from, from, from my point of view, the boxing anthologies, and all of these are available online from sites like Amazon.com and uh, abooks.com. They're available in, in ebook form as well as print form. If you go, or, or you can go to the University of Arkansas Press website which actually is, you get a discount if you go to the University of Arkansas Press website. Uh, you know, those collections of articles really chronicle the contemporary boxing scene year after year after year. And that might be a good place to start. That and Muhammad Ali is like different times. Thomas, you'll have my word that I'll read each of those books as your suggestions. I have one rule that I, I don't start a book until I've finished another one i'm currently reading through tris dixon's damage um apropos Which of this is, interview i will say tris dixon's book damage is a wonderful wonderful book i'm a mm -hmm. tris dixon fan and to me anybody who is involved in boxing is a certainly as a ring doctor working for a commission a manager you know a, a, a fighter anybody who cares about the welfare of the fighter should read damage it is a first-rate book. Thomas, a real pleasure. Thank you for speaking to Seconds Out, and we'll speak uh, again soon, hopefully.